on this Memorial Day. I think it's good to, to look back a little bit uh, on weekend on this weekend. Um, and I want to invite you to go with me to the year is 1858 uh, in Springfield, Illinois. There began a campaign between two uh, famous people, now famous people, uh, running for the Republican seat Senate race there in Illinois. The one guy's name was Stephen Douglas. He was this little giant of a man, a power fa- a force who had won many of the races before. And coming against him was a guy who was notorious for losing political campaigns. He lost, I think, in total, in the totality of his career, 13 uh, efforts towards uh, public office. He won some as well, I will let you know. Um, but that guy's name was Abraham Lincoln. And he began on June 16th his campaign for that Senate race of the new Republican Party. And he began that series of debates and conversations with a a famous line, a verse actually drawing from the scriptures, one that he gave new meaning to um, and became very well known. He, He began his speech this way, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Well, that was the beginning. There were seven debates that uh, Douglas and Lincoln had together, and at the end, Lincoln lost. Well, that race. Several years later, he runs for president of the United States of America and harkens back to these words, a house divided will not stand. And as you know, the story, our nation goes to war over the issue primarily of slavery, the issue of whether or not we allow that to remain or as Lincoln wanted to eradicate it from all the states or as Douglas wanted was to allow every state to make a decision as long as that decision was slave. <laughs> and um And our nation decided that if we were to hold together as a union, then some things had to go for us to be able to stay together and for us to be our better selves. Do you know where that phrase, though, comes from? A house divided shall not stand. Well, we're in a sermon series talking about phrases that are part of the common lexicon or that we may have heard that we may not know come from the scriptures and then delving into the significance of that verse. And the house divided cannot stand is a phrase that Jesus uttered as he was engaged in his ministry before he was nailed to the cross. It's found actually in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three of our synoptic gospels, the ones that tell the chronological story of Jesus' life. And he gets to a place where he's been doing remarkable acts of, of miracles and power of God. And, and people are starting to stand against him, although there's many people following him. A group called the Pharisees, maybe you've heard of them. They say, they say well, Jesus, you're, you, you don't have a following. And then he gets a following. And then they say, well, you don't, you don't have power. And he's like, well, then he does these wondrous works. And, and so instead of saying that he doesn't have power or isn't able to do miraculous things, their claim now is that he's, what he's doing is of the devil. That's literally what they say. They say, well, you're doing these works of, of miracles, these exorcisms and healings, but it's the work of Beelzebub. It's the work of the devil. And Jesus' response to this is to say that, that you, the, the devil doesn't work against himself. Good doesn't work against itself. That a house divided cannot stand. And that if he's doing godly work, then he's not, he's he's part of God because he's doing that godly work. He's not apart from it. He's not separate from it. Now, how do we use it today? How have you used it? You know, commonly today it's used to describe how how it's not possible for a a UVA Cavalier family and a Hokies family to be united together in one house. But or, or maybe that you can't have Red Sox and Yankees fans living together in harmony, right? I mean, we could go on, right? right? Uh, the tidy and the messy living together in harmony. Keep, what is your list of, of the disparate things that don't seem to be able to be held together in union? Well, maybe we shouldn't name too many of them, right? And what Jesus is pointing out is, is if you're doing, if you're seeking the godly, and if you're doing godly things, then whether you even know God, you're doing the work of the Lord. And what we want to share today, among other things, is 
as an invitation to not have a house divided. An invitation instead to be soul and purpose towards the work of God within us. So there's this beautiful story in the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's very peculiar, actually. It's the last of the stories of where God addresses the whole of the humanity, if you will, before God zooms in and chooses a particular family to be a chosen people, to share the light to the other nations. And, and that family was Abraham and Sarah. And just before that, in Genesis chapter 11, we have the story of the Tower of Babel, as it was read for us today by Emily. And the story goes like this. The people, they are united. <laughs> they are together. They're in a place, uh, in a city, and they've developed some new technologies and new things, and they think they've reached the zenith of human civilization. They have discovered bricks. And that was a big deal back then. It really was. And they know now how to make mortar. So they've, they've got mortar, and they've got bricks, and they're putting them together, and they're thinking about how much easier it is to big, build big things without having to chisel every stone, just stack it up on each other, or, or how clay just crumbles in time. And, and the reeds, they help with stability, but you can only go high, so high. And now with bricks, that if they, if they do a ziggurat, and they, they, they layer it, and it spins to its upwards, they can go more than a couple floors. They can go two, three, four hundred feet in the air, even, perhaps. And so they set their minds to building a great city, and within that great city, a great tower. What was the purpose of the tower? So glad you asked. The purpose of the tower was so that they could reach the heavens. And so that, well, let's, let's actually read it here. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens that we will make a name for ourselves with its top in the heavens so that we will make a name for ourselves. Sounds okay. I mean, I hope you make a name for yourself in some ways. I hope you do wonderful and glorious things that others respect. I, I, I hope that my children do things that people are like, that was wonderful. If that's what you mean by making a name, then that would be okay. But, but what's going on here is actually a little bit different from that. We have to start with wh wh who's leading this effort. And the guy who's leading it is a, a guy who's he's the son of Cush, and his name is Nimrod. Never heard of Nimrod before? It's more than a Green Day album. It's, a, it's actually a name of a person in the Old Testament. And his name, translated, literally means rebel. And what he's trying to do is say, well, God, I, I, I wanna, we've developed so much and we are so advanced that we no longer need you to hold us together. We no longer need your call and your purpose. What we're going to do is we're going to build high enough that we pierce the heavens and we take over. We'll become like God. No, no one of us can actually be the Lord. And yet we can establish ourselves to be God of our own lives. And we could try to dominate the lives of others, perhaps even enslave the eyes of others, and be God in their life, to be their Lord. And instead, our, our Bible invites us over and over again to be mindful of that inclination and instead push the brakes when we have that inclination and say, Lord, help me to go with you. Let me be doing your purposes. Let me be doing your work. May it be united in purpose and in mind as long as it is godly. But if it's not godly, Lord, thwart my way. That is the prayerful prayer. But the people were not doing that. Instead, they said, we want to pierce the heavens and we want to make a name for ourselves as apart from what God has called us to. We want to rebel against it. And so what does God do? God has a dialogue with the heavenly host and says, I think we need to go down there and confuse their language and scatter the people. And so this is a story that illustrates, if you will, the, the scattering of humanity across the plains and across continents and different places and having different languages. But it also speaks the reality that, that we, we sometimes want to hold together for things that aren't good. And we need to be divided about from those things that we might pursue something that is even a greater thing. It was a greater thing that we didn't all stay in one place as humanity, but instead we fill the earth. It's a better thing that we would go and we would spread and be of different languages and different nations and different cultures and of different races than all be one and together. No, we are one, but we're one in being made in the image of God with that purpose to serve the Lord in all that we say and we think and we do. We see this lived out in a beautiful way in Acts chapter 2, which is why this day has its name, Pentecost. It's the story of Pentecost. 
And what happens is the disciples and, and others have been left by Jesus. Jesus ascended 10 days earlier after having walked with the, the disciples and others for 40 days in resurrection appearances. So it's been in total 50 days since the last great celebration, Easter. Since Easter happened, it's been 50 days, which is what Pentecost stands for. And on that day of Pentecost, the disciples were all held up in an upstairs room along with the others whom Jesus had appeared to. People of different languages and understandings, of different cultures, but who were all trying to follow the way of Christ. They were together there in Jerusalem. And as they were gathered together, not knowing how to understand each other or speak with each other, a mighty wind rushes in and blows open the windows and the doors. Something like tongues of fire rest upon each one's head. And in the, and the miracle of that moment wasn't just the pouring of the Holy Spirit, but what the Holy Spirit enabled them to do. Do you know what the answer is? It's the reverse of the Tower of Babel. It is God's response to us trying to reach heaven. God says, no, 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 I'm coming to you. You don't have to be good enough to reach me. I care enough to come to you. And so God's Holy Spirit descends upon the people. And although they spoke different languages and could not understand each other, and although they remained speaking different languages, the miracle was that they could begin to understand each other. And they didn't speak that language or that language or that language, but they could understand it and discern it, and they were united in the Spirit of the Lord. Are you hearing me now? It's Pentecost, y'all. It's Pentecost. The church is meant to come together to celebrate unity in the right things and to move forward with a spirit of joy and of power, the authority of the Lord, and to do so, making sure that whatever we do, we don't want to be divided from God as we go about it. Unity together, but div divided from God, is not a blessing. The greater blessing is unity with God, and we work towards the unity with one another. I pray that your household is not divided. I pray that, that you and your neighbors are not divided. I pray that our nation not be divided. But wherever those divisions exist, we ask the Holy Spirit to intercede. And we need to make sure that we're doing our part to be working towards unity of spirit and of godliness together. I pray, God, that God, the Lord thwarted the efforts of those in the Tower of Babel. And I pray that whenever I engage in something that I think is a great idea, but it's not God's will, that the Lord thwart my efforts. I pray that the Lord would thwart your efforts too. If they aren't in union with the will and the spirit of God. And if it is, I pray that the Lord propels you forward with the power of his Holy Spirit. To do works of, of mercy and justice. Miracles take place when we join together as a body of Christ. So this is the birthday of the church. Now, not, I know, not Cal we already celebrated Calvary's birthday. I know you're thinking. But April 2nd, we celebrate the 100th anniversary of Calvary Methodist Church, Calvary United Methodist Church. Well, that's true, but the Church Universal has its celebration, its birthday on Pentecost. And so today we celebrate a birthday with our Orthodox, our Catholic, and our other Protestant brothers and sisters in Christ. We are one in the Spirit of the Lord. We may have differences of how we worship, and how we voice our proclamation of the triune God. And yet we're united with our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world. And God has scattered us around the world that the good news of Jesus Christ would be shared to people of all langu languages, nations, and races. I praise God for that effort. And I pray that the Lord propel you to go forth to be a house united with God's will. Thanks be to God. Amen.